and welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. This week our guests are Peter and Deborah Herbeck, author of Lessons from the School of Love, published by Emmaus Road Publishing, naturally available through our EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com for all things Catholic. Great to see you again, Peter, and good to see you yeah. as well, Thank Deborah. You, Especially, Thank I mean, you. Peter, obviously people know you from the choices we face and certainly crossing the goal, yep. Yep. Danny Abramowitz and the whole team. And of course, but Deborah, actually, you're actually special because you're the. This is the second time you actually it's been true. on Bookmark, yes. right? Yeah. So, what was the first book that we talked about? I think it was called Safely Through the Storm. Mm -hmm. I wrote a like a three little books with quotes from saints and Catholic authors, just about faith, hope, and love. And so that was a number of years ago that I came on and spoke with you. Right. Absolutely. And you're a writer naturally, aren't you? That's I what am. you really do. Yes. Right? Yes, I, I went to school, majored in English, so I love to write. Um, I love opportunities to do that and to edit, so this book was just right up my alley in a certain way. Right, so in the beginning of the book, uh, you both say, Peter, uh, that uh, first it's, it's it, the book doesn't, you know, do say everything about marriage. You also say we do not consider ourselves experts in the marriage or family field, and it's not a storybook. In fact, you initially were a little nervous about doing the book, right? Well, I was... Uh when they first asked us to do it, I thought, well, we're not, I'm not an expert, you know? And I think I feel what felt the way so many parents would feel, like mm -hmm. we're not, we haven't done this perfectly, we gave it our, we're giving it our best shot, but the, the, the title, Lessons from a School mm -hmm. of, the School of Love, I like it because we're still in school. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're so grateful for the lessons we learned from so many people and God's faithfulness, His fidelity, mm -hmm. And, and that's so we're right. really grateful we've done it. It's now, Deborah, you're the writer, as I mentioned, and I say sitting down to write a book together has exposed our shortcomings. Uh, do we have time to go over those? <laughs> or, no. uh... I think we need a week for that. <laughs> but um, as he said, we're not experts in parenting. We're certainly not experts in marriage. And right. I think, you know, there's this a little bit of fear and trepidation when you begin to open up your life to everyone and anyone, right. um, which we want to do authentically that um, there's a lot there that um, is still in progress. Um, we have a lot of failings and shortcomings, and we came into the marriage in that state, and we've hopefully helped one another right. be better as we journey toward heaven, but um, we brought a lot into the marriage that, you know. Which you're very honest about yeah, and rec recount when you talk mm -hmm. about your, your childhood and also, sure. yeah, Peter, your childhood, the wonderful things of it, but some of the things that went sure. on. But sure. do you think also, Deborah, the idea with something like this is no one's perfect. Nobody's exactly. perfectly doing it right. Yeah. The reality is we're all struggling, right? Yeah, and just giving people permission to kind of admit that, right. join the club, you know, where no, no one's doing it perfectly. And the goal is to, to do this with Jesus' help. but. We're coming in broken people, and um, we will also leave this earth broken people, you know, and right. by God's grace, He's going to restore us. So that's good news, even though it doesn't feel like good news sometimes. Right. Now, Peter, you, you say in the book here, the both of you write about, marriage is a supernatural vocation. It takes supernatural power to live it well. People say, well, how am I supposed to succeed then? Yeah, well, it comes from being tied to the supernatural one, to the Lord Himself. And I think that the key point of the book is, we're so grateful for the reality of what the church has given us, the power of the sacrament of matrimony, disciples of Jesus who've helped us along the way. And we can look back now, I'm about to turn 65, and we've got kids and grandkids. We go back and say, you know what? Really, if you look at it and you, you embrace the sacramental marriage, you embrace the reality of the Lord is living with us and He will lead us. We don't have to be afraid of anything. Just keep following Him. You stumble and fall, get up again, repent of your sins, keep going. And we look back and say, God's grace is amazing yeah. how much He's helped us. And uh, so, yeah. So, Debbie, you, in the beginning, you kind of lay out yourself as being somebody uh, about the differences in a sense of, of the two of you, you being kind of introverted, coming from a, a Jewish family in, mm -hmm. in Chicago. Here's Peter living a, a German small Minnesota, little German farming small town, farm, yeah, as yeah. I recall. Southern Minnesota. Right. But the one thing that seems to unite the two of you at one level is talking about dysfunction in your families to some degree. <laughs> yeah. But I wonder, I mean, we say dysfunction, but is anybody functional, you know, these days? Uh, I mean, it seems like it's probably all of us with original sin have some form of dysfunction in our family. It doesn't make us bad people, right? Right, absolutely. And, you know, when we got married 30, 36 years ago, the, people didn't talk about it right. that openly. It was like you went to counseling and you kind of whispered that that happened. Nowadays, People are very open and honest about it, which is a really, really good thing to be able to identify that. 
we did not really bond over our dysfunction. I think we bonded over the Lord and our, and, um, and our faith. Right. But as we began to live together, that dysfunction, I mean, it's hard to live with another person. And right. so all that woundedness and some of that dysfunction just gets revealed right. as you begin to live together. Yeah, and you lost an older brother in a car crash, right? I did, yes, when I was a teenage girl, and that was a very painful thing, but also a piece of my journey that really led me right. to deeper faith. Because maybe you questioned God absolutely. in that aspect yeah, of it. Yeah, absolutely. I also thought it was interesting, you said, God, if you're real, show me. If Jesus is the Messiah, give me the faith to believe. And of course, it happened instantaneously, but it didn't, did it? No, it was a journey of maybe nine months to a year of really seeking after him. I grew up as a Jew not even knowing who Jesus was, so I was really starting at ground zero with my faith life and really praying earnestly for the understanding of right. who is this man, could he be the Messiah? And right. through a series of incidents and um, revelation really of the Lord, he revealed that to right. me. Now Peter, with your family, your, your dad had some issues, uh, yeah. uh, post-traumatic, so very uh, he was a tank commander in General Patton's army, yep. World War II, but he unfortunately had to see what was going on at, at Mauthausen yeah. concentration camp. Interesting connection in a sense of that, yeah. and, and obviously yeah. your background as well. Now, who was your sister Kathy, and why was she important to you? Uh, she's the firstborn of the family, and I would say you know we was one of seven kids. We grew up next to the cathedral, went to Catholic schools churchgoers, but the 70s were happening, and my older siblings, some of them were drifting, some of them weren't. She really had a serious encounter through the help and witness of a good priest, and uh, came back to the family with a different perspective on Dad's situation. Dad had gone to treatment a few times. We had done a family intervention. Nothing ever quite worked. He was able to keep the balls. You know, he's a successful guy, political guy, but also he had this problem. But uh, we kind of lost hope anything would ever change. This is just the way it's always going to be. But she brought a perspective of the fact Jesus is alive. Uh, there's, he wants to help us if we turn our hearts to him seriously, sincerely pursuing him. He's going to help our family come to health together. And, to right. really, and so conversions began to happen. And there's a lot to the story. But right. siblings of mine came back to the church more strongly. And my dad eventually really went to treatment, got healed. And he was right. sober for the last 20 years of his life. So. That was a critical moment for me, learning a lesson to say, like St. Paul says, make it your aim to please the Lord, seek Him, and He will handle the rest. Mm -hmm. Just because we can't handle it all, we right. can't fix it all. Pursue Him and do His will, and that's what we, we learned how to do in a way right. we didn't know how to do before. Mm -hmm. so, so I would think you also say marriage doesn't automatically heal past wounds and make everything better. I always thought marriage is like an intensifier. The good things get yeah. more intense, and the, and the tougher things seem to get it's more true. intense. Yeah. But yeah. I thought it was interesting too with what you said and, and also the idea of trust because mm -hmm. it seems to me that that's a real problem today, especially for younger people, the, 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 their inability to trust anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I work a lot with young, young women, um, teenagers, young adults, and you see it, it's corroded, kind mm -hmm. of the trust in authority, trust in family because people have been failed, you know, right. and epically failed. And if we're not putting our trust in the only one mm -hmm. who's trustworthy, the foundation is pretty shaky, and so and understandably so. Right. That is one of the reasons we wrote the book too, Doug, was to say we saw a lot of young people afraid to get married, confused about how to date, what is dating all about, intimidated by it. We're thinking, oh, this is this is the great gift. This is God's creation, and weak and broken people like us, like everybody, just gets married. If you really live it, it's the richest thing you can experience right. in the world. So. It's interesting, too, because uh, to follow up on your saying, Peter, in the welcome to the battle, uh, uh, this isn't the battling Bickersons, it's a bigger battle than that, yeah. uh, apparently here, uh, which is today's God plan for marriage and families at the center of an intense spiritual battle. The language of spiritual battle is considered extreme, negative, outdated, or even psychologically and spiritually unhealthy. Why do you think there's a pushback against understanding the spiritual nature of this battle? Well, we live, we're living in a culture that's increasingly secularized, so it doesn't live with any with an eternal perspective or a biblical worldview, and that the ground and a lot of people don't like the clarity of the biblical worldview. Uh, even you know, baptized people want to. No, it's bad news. I don't want to relate to it. Right. But we're witnessing a profound spiritual conflict, the deconstruction of family. The, the devil's going for the big enchilada, ground zero of the spiritual battle, as we know. Our Lady uh, told us, and many other saints, this is this is the battle. Uh, of our time mm -hmm. right now. And so one of the reasons we were glad at the end of the day to write the book was to say, let's make a little contribution, our little contribution to the witness of God's right. presence and power in the midst of this battle. We don't have to be afraid. 
And you write in here in the book, today's cancel culture provides a vivid example of the world's attempt to intimidate Christians into accepting the redefinition of family, human sexuality, and human, human identity itself. Uh, are you surprised at how overwhelming, how quickly this has hit the family? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, working with youth, I think over the last five or six years, the dramatic change or the accelerated pace of it is pretty pretty astounding. I know that it's been in the works for a while, but we're seeing it emerge now and the, the pace of it is just unbelievable. Right. Yeah. And as you said, Peter, the idea, and even you quote say Peter here in the book, both of you do, about the devil prowling, mm -hmm. you know, looking for souls and people think, oh yeah, okay, I got it. You say, despite the sobering reality of what we are up against, the Lord wants us to know that he is with us every step of the way. Why is that so important for especially a couple to understand who's because struggling? Because knowing that Jesus has won the victory over these things, that he's present in our lives gives us hope, confidence that we can face anything that comes to us and any kind of obstacle and we we just as Christians we just need to live with hope we don't need to be afraid a lot of the people are afraid of the the devil's so big and the world's so big and it's so overwhelming well in in light of Christ no it's it's not he's not so yeah I also yeah. think it helps a couple see themselves as part of the solution mm -hmm. yeah. like I'm not a victim here right I can really choose we can choose together by the grace of God to really be uh, an answer to the world's problem. It, it's interesting so. you say that because mm -hmm. so much of the world today is immersed in victimhood. Yeah, in yeah. finding so. where I'm a victim because yeah. I don't want to be responsible for fixing what I'm upset about. Yeah. I want to be able to point a finger and say, it's not my fault. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I think even in our own relationship, like I know personally to be very honest and open, I took that mentality for a while saying there's brokenness and woundedness in me. I have been a victim in some ways. And I don't want to. I don't know if I want to go there to fix it, but love demands something greater than that. Mm -hmm. it demands courage. It demands honesty and openness. And so when you do that, there's such beautiful fruit that happens, and it's powerful. So right. I believe that married couples in the church with families are the solution to what we're facing today. Now, you, you yourself, though acknowledging in the beginning that marriage doesn't fix everything, at some point when you started off you believed that it would solve the problems and, 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 and take care of all the things to come in the future. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of naivete. It's right. like looking at this guy and thinking, well, hey, oh, she knew you know. she was Mary and Doug. It's pretty self -evident. And then I'm like, oh, he's yes. not the Messiah. He's just <laughs> Peter Herbeck, you know, and we're going to, you know, he's got his own stuff. So yeah, I yeah. think that, you know, there's that awakening. I don't know how far, you know, two weeks into the marriage, when you get back from right. the honeymoon, you roll over and you're like, whoa, okay. Right. That's right. The reality starts yes. to kick in. Yeah. When not if the storm of life comes and we are pushed beyond our human strength and understanding, we'll discover whether the foundation of our marriage is built built upon the rock or shifting sands and it says here that you guys implemented some practical ways to keep God at the center and to express your trust in him what's mm -hmm. an example uh, well one concrete example very practical a friend of mine said you know as we were starting to have kids life was very busy I was doing international travel trying to figure out and so communication is a key issue right mm -hmm. well when you're busy sometimes that falls through the cracks it causes trouble so he said do this he said I recommend do a, a weekly husband and wife meeting and I said husband and wife I don't need another meeting but what do you mean you mean a date night and he goes no no sit down where you can cover the critical things. So here's what we did in a nutshell. There's four, th we'd meet, we'd get together, get a babysitter, we'd sit down, we'd cover, uh, we'd uh, talk first about how we're doing. Deb, how are you doing? So she'd ask me, I'd ask her, we'd talk about how our relationship is going. Secondly, each of the kids, how's Sarah doing? How's Michael doing? How's Joshua doing? We'd discuss Rachel. kind of what's Rachel, yeah, Rachel uh, it, together. And then uh, we'd pray for them. And then we'd get out our calendars and say, okay, what do we got going for the next 10, 10 days, two weeks? Uh, you know, because you're moving at a high pace, you got all that right. complex life there, and it brought peace. It brought a certain amount of peace to it, and then we take time to pray together uh, for the kids and for the essential things that we think are on the table for the Herbex, and we're trying to listen to the Lord together as He's helping us shepherd and create a family culture and shepherd our kids and love each other. Right. So. It was interesting too, if I read it right, you're praying together, but you also allow for each other to have separate prayer times. Yeah, yeah. Why yeah. did and you decide that? Well, I think it, it, it just focuses on the underlying uh, reality that each of us have an individual personal relationship with, with Jesus, right. that I'm not looking to Peter to be everything for me, right. that I'm going 
to the Lord and I'm drawing from that source and so I need time to do that um, and he needs time to do right. that and we come together to pray certainly but we need to right. continue to grow our own individual relationships. Right. Who came up with your family motto? Um, that was maybe the, the source from praying together. Mm -hmm. I ma we make it our aim to please the Lord I think we were I mean it's St. Paul came up with it. Yeah himself, yeah it was, but, a, it was <laughs> just a passage that just kind of uh, it was a laser shot every once in a while, you know, you're, you're reading the Bible and bam, light goes on. Mm -hmm. That was one of those passages. Yeah, this, it's not complicated. It's not easy where you're going, right. but it's not complicated. Make it your aim to please Him, bring everything you're struggling with in your life under His Lordship and ask the fundamental question, whether it's a relationship struggle, uh, what are we going to do with our finances, whatever, what pleases the Lord, and uh, it, it's really very helpful, mm -hmm. right. helpful guide. And uh, you recommend other people doing that, right? Yeah, highly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what my, ours will be. I'll have to figure that one out. Uh, <laughs> my wife probably has a couple in mind. Yeah. Christian family is rooted in the self-donating love between a father and a mother who are seeking to imitate Jesus' love. I, therefore, the cost of married love is significant and sacrifices require will entail suffering. The most immediate sacrifice will likely be the experience of having to put someone else for a sacrifice. Mm. That repels a lot of people today. They say, hey, you know, if it doesn't feel good, I really am not interested. Yeah, well then your marriage is going to fail right. Right. because it's, it's woven into the fabric of married life, especially if you have children. That's why people are having dogs instead of children right. because you only have to feed them once a day and walk them. Seriously, because this requires this level of sacrifice so that we can be like Jesus and love the way that he loves. So it's just intrinsic to what it's all about. Um, so let's get real if you can't. If you're not willing to at least expose yourself to the grace to mm -hmm. have that happen, your marriage won't make it. Right. And in a lot of ways, I know even when we were involved in marriage account, a lot of people go in with the 50-50 and it's like, no, it's like 120 plus 100 to yeah. 120, yeah, you know, exactly. each yeah. have to be yeah. giving 100% yeah. exactly. uh, to make it work. You, you talk about in the section uh, having to do with lessons from the school of love, you talk about love being generous, the practical reality is wasn't always easy. I didn't always do it with an ease or joy. This is you, Deborah. Mm -hmm. Especially as Peter traveled often when our kids were young and our relatives didn't live nearby to help. How is that tough when someone feels called to do something? But that's great, but you're still back there and you're still taking care of the daily duties of everything. Yeah, I mean, I think, like you said, it's never 50-50. And one of the things I learned early on is you, I cannot hold that over his head. Mm -hmm. I cannot kind of keep keeping score and you owe me this, or you owe me that. It has to be a willing gift. And, um, and that's not even on an emotional level. It's like, will, you know, the love is the willing, the good of the other, um, and yeah. allowing him to go for the sake of his calling, knowing that God w is still right. caring for us. You know? Right, you say here, there is a tremendous freedom and joy in not trying to possess other people or, other, or our material goods, but viewing everything as belonging to God. Yeah, yeah. And really it is. And one of the things, my father was such a generous man, and I think I learned that, that quality of generosity mm -hmm. from, from Jake, um, just his, the way he opened his home and his money. It was all like, he said, you know, there's nothing you have that you can take with you when right. you die. Right. And so he had a very generous heart, and I think um, we've been able to live that in our family life together, too. Mm -hmm. Now, Peter, listen to love covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> Even when we encounter one another's failures, weakness, and annoying habits, we're commanded to practice mercy and forgiveness, right? Yeah, and that, I think that's a critical piece, and I, we learned that pretty early on, our first year of marriage, uh, different times where we'd have mm -hmm. conflict, how are we going to handle it? And it's amazing what surfaces when, when you start living with someone so closely and it's easy to think, well, the reason we're having this problem, this person is the cause of the problem. <laughs> and this person needs to ask my forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I don't need to ask her forgiveness because she's the one who's at fault. You know, that right. kind of stuff. It just, it's, it's immature, but it's really built into the fallen human heart. And accepting the call of Jesus to be generous, to right. be merciful, to seek forgiveness, to repent when you need to repent, to forgive one another generously, and try to create a culture that in the family what happens with the kids too. Is well, as you, as a follow up thing. on that, forgiveness means uh, refusing to make someone pay for what they did, even if they deserve it. Yeah. Often the most difficult part of forgiving another is facing the fact that we, we don't actually want to forgive. Yeah. 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 Well, that's really true. It's like, no, I'm hanging on to this for a while. You know, we had a, we had a big argument early on in our marriage one night, and I left the, I left the house, went walking around. I was mad. I was self-justified. Self Debbie was sleeping. 
I get home, go to bed, I get up in the morning, and I've got my Bible out, and I'm having a little prayer time. And I, in my heart, I felt like the Lord said, go, go repent to your wife. I said, for what? She did it. You know what I mean? Like, go and ask forgiveness. And first thing in the morning, we, we, did, we went and we talked, and I asked Debbie for forgiveness. And we sat down and wrote, got out three by five cards and said, how are we going to handle these kinds of things in the future. Like, how are we going to have a healthy fight? Right. Or how are we going to handle our conflicts? And yep. just kind of wrote things down. Is that what you came up Bible? with the cards? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. We came right. up with cards about right. what would be helpful so that we, right. we, we, then let's commit to doing these things in the moment the best we can. Right. And it helped. It wasn't perfect, but it helped. Yeah. Now, De Debbie, the world says if earthen vessel, and this is in the section earthen yeah. vessel, which we all are, has lost its shine, just find another one. But you say the world's treasure is a cheap counterfeit. How so? Yeah, I think. Um, we're always looking for something better. You know, the grass is always greener. And I think in a world today where everything is so visual, and we can see how almost everyone in the world is living 24 7, we have to fight well, the that way they portray their living. Portray, right? right yeah. What's <laughs> real or not. So we have to fight that temptation to say, if I only had a different guy, or if I only had a different wardrobe, or if I only had a different car in my driveway, or if I only had different kids, you mm -hmm. know, and realize this is who God has given you to love. Yeah. And so to just remember that reality and call that to mind, right. um, that all the glitters is not gold. Right. So let's focus on what we have. God doesn't love, quote unquote, ideal people or virtual beings. He loves actual real people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Warts and all, right? Right, yeah. absolutely. That's all he's got to work with, actually. Right. Mm -hmm. That's who we are, yeah. In the section on building our way of life, when we were first approached about writing a book on marriage and family life, my initial response was, thank you for the opportunity, but no. Yeah. That was you. That, that was me, yeah. And partly because I, what I had in mind, what came to mind was like a, an expert's book, like mm -hmm. here's all the things you should be doing. And I, I, inside I just wanted to say, we, we want to make a contribution to this, but it's got to be real. It's got to be transparent. It's got to be practical. It's got to be simple and short enough that men could read it with their wives. It's got to be all those things. And, and uh, it was great working with Emmaus Road because they, they were very helpful along the way and they liked right. our ideas. And so... Right, and, and, and they're all good, and they're all not that difficult in the sense of coming, like you said, family dinner, how important that is mm -hmm. to get everybody together. Yeah. Family prayer time. The one I liked here jumped out at me was tradition because of your background, and yeah. obviously the great show and the great song tradition from... Tradition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah from okay. Fiddler on the Roof. Da, 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 right, dun. absolutely. Yeah. So, And that is important. And what's great with you, too, is you really get to, to, to really feature both traditions in your family oh my and your gosh. household, right? We love it. It was so important. It was a non-negotiable as we were dating right, and right. moving into um, engagement to say, this is this is my identity. Just because I, I'm a believer in Jesus and I'm now a Catholic doesn't mean that I'm still not a Jew. Mm -hmm. And my children will be Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, who doesn't love Hanukkah and Christmas, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Passover and Easter. Sure. A lot of work, but so... <laughs> so enriching, you know, and we've seen this in our children's lives, how much it's added to the, their mm -hmm. identity. Right. As we're near the end here, chapter five, Mission Possible, Helping Our Children Encounter Christ. That probably seems to be the toughest thing a lot of people are really dealing with yeah. today mm -hmm. is, is, is having survived the 60s and the 70s themselves, yeah. you know, have uh, kept the kids in the church and then they're dealing whether it's uh, what's going on in the high school or at college sure. or just the culture itself just come and saying, well, you know, maybe not, you know, what do you think, Dad? Yeah, no, we, we knew from the beginning that what this calling is, is to make disciples, to raise our children, we don't think about it that way, but how do we do that? And so we, we made commitments, decisions to get the right people into their lives, to have the right kind of family life together. Said so we tried a lot of different things, different kinds of ways to pray and kids, get kids on mission, mm -hmm. get them in service projects, bring other families together with us that shared same values. It was a constant thing. It was just constantly trying to be both creative and committed and intentional mm -hmm. to engage them in moments of encounter with Christ, but also giving themselves away in service and being able to experience right. their family in that way. So. Now, Debbie, in Chapter 6, Husbands and Fathers, one cannot overstate the importance of a unique, basic role of that fathers play in establishing and building, maintaining, and passing on the faith. And we've seen that even in studies, how yes, that works sure. out like that. But there seems to be not only an attack on the family, but an incredible attack on the father figure yeah. in a family, right? Yeah, I mean, father as representing God the Father and right. that kind of spiritual umbrella or covering, if that's removed, then just it seems like there's a vulnerability there. And I want to just say, 
personally in our family, Peter's had a tremendous role in the lives of our daughters, and girls mm -hmm. need dads in their mm -hmm. lives, and it impacts who they choose, who their partners are, how they think about themselves, their understanding and belief about if they're beautiful and loved right. and valued, and so he's done a great job with our girls being able to convey right. that just through his, his loving attentiveness to them. So very important. Whose idea was it in the back of the book to kind of include questions for each related chapter and uh, with the idea that it could be used either as a couple or, or in a group setting? Yeah, that was actually our editor and publisher okay. just to say we want this to be really practical, mm -hmm. which I love because um, it, it's got to go from here to here as well and how is this being lived out in your home? Let's hold each other accountable. Right. Let's make a plan like we did. 35 years ago. Let's make a plan for how we're going to live this and let's That's build. That's right. Marriage and God's plan, as they would say. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Peter and Deborah Herbeck. The book, Lessons from the School of Love, Cultivating a Christ-Centered Marriage. Boy, can we use it now. Published by Emmaus. Available through EWTN's religious catalog, EWTNRC.com, all things Catholic. Thanks for joining us on this week's Bookmark. We'll see you next time. Thanks.